Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is all about renting in British Columbia. My name is Paula Price. I'm with the People's Law School, and we are excited to be joined by three incredible speakers, Lisa Mackey, Emma Lasso, and Robert Williams, who I'll be introducing in just a few minutes. Now, as we mentioned, today's webinar is all about renting in British Columbia. And our speakers are going to answer your questions about everyday legal issues as they relate to renting. And the questions that we have today that we've prepared are questions that come up most frequently in the practices of our panelists. So these are very common questions. Over the next 60 minutes, we will provide answers to legal questions. What we're doing is sharing legal information, not advice. So if what you're seeking is the law as it applies to your set of circumstances, we encourage you to seek legal advice from a lawyer or from someone. Um, you can reach out to Alexander Holber and Lisa. Her information is on the slide. You're also welcome to reach out to the Tenancy Resource and Advisory Center, Residential Tenancy Branch. The contact information is on the slide. And just one last note, the information we share is current as of today, which is April 26, 2022. We would like to acknowledge um, that we are grateful to work on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, whose peoples continue to live on and care for these lands. We would invite everyone who is joining us from across the province to consider where they are joining us from as well. We would also like to thank <coughs> the Department of Justice Canada, the Law Foundation of British Columbia, and the Notary Foundation, whose funding makes production of today's webinar possible. And finally, we would love to thank and welcome our speakers today. We have three amazing speakers who are each sharing a unique perspective that we think will really enrich today's conversation. First, we have Lisa Mackey. She is a lawyer and leader of the Strata Property Practice Group at Alexander Holborn, which is a law firm in downtown Vancouver. And Lisa is a return speaker. She was here a couple of months ago with Tony Giaventu. They spoke about stratas. And if you have any questions about stratas, we would invite you to go back and watch that webinar. It was excellent. And a large part of Lisa's practice is speaking or residential tenancy law and she acts for both landlords, she acts for tenants, and so Lisa provides a wonderful perspective from both of those angles. So welcome Lisa. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Next we have Robert Williams and Robert is an information officer and investigator with the residential tenancy branch and if you're not familiar with the residential tenancy branch it is an organization that is central to today's discussion. We are really lucky and delighted to welcome Robert to our webinar today. Robert, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Emma Lasso. And Emma is the Public Legal Education Coordinator for the Tenant Resource and Advisory Center, which I will refer to as TRAC. And Emma is uh, a speaker. She has been speaking, providing workshops and webinars for uh, tenants across the province and sharing with them resources that help them in their tenancy relationships. And we are so glad to have Emma with us today. <coughs> Emma, thank you for being here. Thank you for having all of us here and um, we are ready for your questions. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm, I'm, I think everyone else is ready to hear your answers. So with that, we'll turn to the questions and our first question is for Robert. And Robert, the question is, what is the res Residential Tenancy Branch and what does it do? Okay, so this is the ultimate existential question for what we do here. So um, the, base, um, the basic answer to this is the Residential Tenancy Branch provides landlords and tenants with information and dispute resolution services guided by British Columbia's Residential Tenancy Act and Manufactured Home Park Tenancy Act. The RTB provides resources to help individuals know their rights and responsibilities as both landlords and tenants. So, I mean, that's the, the more generic term. So, uh, to go a little bit more in depth, there are three sort of major components to the residential tenancy branch organization and how we provide services to the public. So, firstly, we have um, our information services branch, which is where, where I currently uh, work, and we um, 
man the phone line and uh, emails. Uh, we answer questions regarding specific, we, we answer specific questions regarding tenancy law in BC. Now it's, um, it is, uh, it is a bit interesting because I, I think that a lot of people may not understand um, the fact that we are uh, and have to remain a neutral party uh, in, in this process. So we do get, you know, something around a thousand calls a day. Um, and uh, a lot of people are here to, you know, seeking uh, legal advice or like are looking for an advocate or trying to be advised on something where that's not really what we do. We basically just provide people with what, you know, basically what the act says and, um, and, you know, and also, you know, potentially guide them on approaches for resolving their disputes. So um, if people are looking for advice, then it would probably, it, it would be more suited for them to contact like track or, or a lawyer or somebody like that. Whereas if you're just seeking information, then that's, then you would be giving us a call. The second part of our, um, the second major component of our branch is the dispute resolution services, which is uh, basically a quasi-judicial um, uh, service uh, for landlord and tenant disputes. And like I said earlier, it can be um, disputes uh, regarding issues within the Residential Tenancy Act and the manufactured and or the manufactured Home Park Tenancy Act as we oversee both those uh, pieces of legislation. Um, so at this, um, at these, these are essentially hearings that, that, um, that both landlords and tenants can have. They come to uh, the, the residential tenancy branch. There's, they they um, present arguments in front of an arbitrator and the arbitrator can issue binding decisions such as ordering the tenants to vacate a unit, um, ordering, pos ordering possession for tenants who have been illegally evicted from units, uh, monetary compensation, the arbitrators can order landlords to make repairs um, and, and, and so forth. Uh, and and um, finally, the third major component of the branch is our newly formed, uh, well, I guess it's not super newly formed now, it's about a few years old now, but is our compliance and enforcement um, unit, which is basically um, they uh, receive complaints from, you know, either internally from the government, from other ministries, from um, MLA offices, from um, from, from the general public, um, uh, and they investigate um, they investigate basically major, uh, significant, uh, repetitive issues of noncompliance from landlords and tenants in BC, and they do have the ability to impose administrative penalties um, on on people on individuals and businesses and property managers who are found to be not in compliance with not in, not in compliance with the act. So those are the three major branches. Thank you so much, Robert. And it's so interesting to hear, and we'll go into more detail in terms of the specifics, like the dispute resolution. And really interesting to know as well that what you're providing is information that you are a neutral body. Mm -hmm. And um, I just like to highlight for those who are interested that your website is fantastic. And there's all sorts of information on the website. There are forms on the website, and we'll get into that, but um, such a valuable resource. Um, Thank you. So our, our next question is for you, Emma. And um, the question here is, what is the Tenant Resource and Advisory Center, so TRAC, and what support does it provide for tenants? Hello, everyone. Um, uh, we are a nonprofit center, and mostly we support tenants across BC. Um, we also provide different services. We do not provide legal advice. We do have lawyers that you could potentially talk to. And if you're lucky enough, and if they can take the call, they might give you advice, but we normally don't. The people who stuff the information line are not lawyers. And so what we do on the information line is exactly what the residential tenancy branch does, which is provide free legal information. And so uh, the residential tenancy branch sends people to us with that idea, but I just want to clarify that we do not give legal advice. Um, also at TRAC, we provide different services. One, information. We provide information through um, our website and also through our publication, the Tenant Survival Guide. And we also do um, education through webinars and in-person workshops, but due to COVID, we can't 
uh, do that. We also provide education through our online free course, Rent and Ed Right, that now has been um, updated. And so now we have three sections on the course. You get a certificate at the end. And we also do advocacy for renters in BC. And that comes to answer the second question What support does TRAC uh, provide for tenants? Well, we represent clients in BC, we represent low income folks, and there is a threshold that the lawyers and the advocates have established to accept people. So the way we work is um, first, we do information on the phone. We have an information line. Um, we answer questions from Monday through Fridays, services in English only, as we are a very small center. There are only seven of us for the whole province. So we are not as big as the residential tenancy branch. Um, we also do um, information, as I said before, on the information line. Monday, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, we are open from 1 to 5, and on Wednesdays, we are open from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. So those are uh, the services we offer on the info line. You, know, you, will, uh, you will get answers on evictions, you will get answers on deposit returns, etc. And so, um, as I said before, we represent tenants in BC, but we also work with local advocates. And so, uh, if you are in Chilliwack and then you want us to intake you, uh, we will work with the Chilliwack advocate instead of us getting involved we can advise we can provide support but that's about it uh, we have an intake process and you can visit our website attendance.bc.ca where you can go under get help legal representation and then you get the information from from um, our intake worker you can call her she'll do an intake she'll pass on to the landlord to the lawyers i'm sorry to the lawyers and the advocates and they will make a final decision to see if the case has merit. That's about our services. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Emma. It's um, excellent information. And again, I'd like to refer anyone who's interested in learning more to your website, because there's a host of information there, including template letters and all sorts of resources. So we'll get into that more as we get through the webinar, but um, such uh, great information. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for you, Lisa. And this is for uh, landlords. If you are a landlord and you're interviewing a prospective tenant, what kind of questions are you allowed to ask them? This is a great question. Uh, and it's an important one as well, because uh, when you're bringing somebody into your home, um, that becomes a very close relationship. So you want to make sure that at the outset, it looks like it'll be a good one. Um, the last place you want to go is the residential tenancy branch to resolve a dispute. You don't wanna call a lawyer. <laughs> Nobody likes to speak to a lawyer. So if you can actually form a good relationship at the start and that begins with a tenant interview, uh, you're well on your way to a successful tenancy. So what kind of questions can you ask? Well, the Residential Tenancy Act doesn't actually help us there. It uh, talks about what happens after a tenancy is formed. So we're sort of left to our own to figure out uh, what kind of questions we can ask. And we look at privacy laws to see how much we can ask a tenant to provide before they enter into a contract for a tenancy with us. Uh, we look at human rights uh, laws as well as to we want to make sure that we're not asking questions that might discriminate or alienate against people applying to rent in our rental properties. Uh, essentially, whatever is reasonably necessary for you to make a determination as to whether the tenant is suitable for you. So uh, first and foremost, I like to ask for tenants names, uh, the names of any occupants and the number of occupants that want to rent the property. If there's any four legged roommates <laughs> that intend to reside with them, so any pets, that's good to know straight out the gate as well. Past landlord references are also key. So uh, you will have that brief interaction um, with the individual wanting to rent from you. And what better way to predict the future than look at the past. And so interviewing previous uh, landlords uh, is a great idea. Um, performing a credit check, assuming that everything else checks out and you feel that this candidate is your best candidate. Um, checking to make sure that they can afford the rent um, and that that will be a successful component. You can't have a rental agreement without the rent. So that's, uh, that's one of the key elements to confirm as well. Um, but making sure that you know the individual that is coming into the property as best you can. And hopefully uh, you don't need to call a lawyer later or uh, face a dilemma at the residential tenancy branch. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Lisa. And can, I, can I add one one thing to that? Sorry. There's a um, the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner actually has a fantastic document uh, called Private Sector Landlord and Tenants that they, they do a bit of a 
um, a more granular breakdown as to some of the questions, like when they are appropriate to ask, like what you can ask, what you can't ask, and some that are maybe appropriate under some circumstances. It's different, some specific situations, um, but it's a fantastic resource. And, uh, you know, we, we look at that here at the residential tenancy branch. And I, I would also like to add up to that. Uh, there is also an excellent document that was created by the BC Liberties during COVID times. So what is your landlord allowed to ask during COVID times? Um, on the information line, we get questions such as, hey, my landlord is asking if I am vaccinated. So I would strongly suggest for you to look for that document. It's really good. Beautiful. Thank you, everybody. And we've also got on the People's Law School website, uh, uh, a, a page that talks about the types of questions and when it's appropriate. So um, we will provide links to all of these resources in the notes that accompany today's webinar. The next question is for you, um, Robert, and what in, needs to be included in a residential tenancy agreement? Are there any illegal terms? And what if you don't have a written agreement? Okay, so this is these are very, very, very common questions. So what needs to be in um, a tenancy agreement? Uh, so it's it's kind of a funny thing in the in the Residential Tenancy Act. It says that all all tenancies after a certain date must be in writing. But then there's a provision right underneath it that says, but if, if for whatever reason if you do not have something in writing, it's still valid. So it's kind of a kind of a funny thing in the act. So um, so to be clear, kind of answering the the um, the last question first, um, uh, a verbal contract still um, is, is still uh, provides. Um, all the rights of the standard terms that that a written contract would, because the standard terms are inherent in any in any single in any single tenancy agreement. Uh, standard terms basically can can um, you know basically talk about the length of the tenancy, uh, the, uh, the the deposits, um, whether or not tenants are allowed to sublet. So these are things that are always in an agreement, whether whether they're written or not. Um, so they're called standard terms. And you can find those under the residential tenancy regulations under schedule. So at the very bottom of the regulations under schedule, you'll see them <coughs> basically all listed out there. Uh, now, are there any legal terms? Well, I mean, yes. Uh, so there are two things that, that, would, um, that would, you'd want to consider when adding additional terms to your tenancy agreement. One would be does it contradict the act? So one thing written in the act is that the act is basically unavoidable and you can't contract outside of the act. So if you have any terms in the, in your tenancy agreement that contradict the act, um, you know, there, um, and that could be restricting guests or, uh, you know, saying that uh, the tenants aren't allowed to have guests come over after 6 p.m. or something like that. Something to the fact that that would directly contradict what the act is saying, even though it's signed, it's something that that necessarily won't be enforceable. I like to use the example on the form on the phone when people, you know, when people like they tend to argue this point because they're like, well, we agreed to this. But, you know, you can't um, just because you agree to it doesn't mean that the residential tenancy branch is going to enforce it. So uh, I, I always like to give the, the dramatic example of like you, the landlord could say that at the end of the tenancy, you, you get to keep their firstborn son. But that, they both agreed to that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the landlord, that, that the residential tenancy branch is going to enforce something like that. So um, so that's something to keep in mind. Also, another thing, uh, and it's a bit more subjective, is uh, if the term is can, could be considered to be unconscionable, which would mean grossly unfair to either one of the parties. So, um, so if there's something something of that nature, um, it's it sometimes it's not always as obvious. It's a, it could be a bit more nuanced. So that that's something that if there's something that you, you deem to be, you feel is quite unfair in your tenancy agreement and the landlord's <laughs> trying to enforce it, an arbitrator could, could, could deem that term to be unconscionable. Uh, an example of that would be um, the, um, let's say there's a duplex, a, a, a landlord owns a duplex that has two units. Um, it would be, uh, it could be considered to be unconscionable if the landlord required the upstairs tenants to pay for the utilities for the entire, for the entire building because they're paying for they would end up be essentially be paying for space that they do not use or occupy and for power that that you know that another tenant is using so so that's something that they could put in a tenancy agreement that could be an expectation but at the end of the day uh, an arbitrator would likely deem that to be unconscionable so it would be not something that you would be able to enforce 
Super. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. Our next question is for you, Lisa. And the question here is, what is a mutual agreement to end a tenancy? And when is this an option and how does it work? That's a great question as well. So um, it will not be a surprise to hear that a mutual agreement to end tenancy is a mutual agreement to end a tenancy. It's sort of spoiler alert in the title. <laughs> um, so the way that the Residential Tenancy Act works is there's multiple ways to end a tenancy. So one might be by a tenant's notice to end tenancy. Another is by a landlord's notice to end tenancy. But when you both agree, that's called a mutual agreement to end tenancy. Um, the document itself uh, is pretty basic. It's, uh, it just requires the names of the parties. So the name of the landlord and the name of the tenants, all of the tenants uh, on the lease, uh, the address of the rental property and when the tenancy is deemed to be an end by agreement of both of the parties. Um, we spoke today about the resources available on the Residential Tenancy Branch website, and this is one such resource. So on the branch website, there's a sample mutual agreement to end tenancy that you can use that is a one page document, very straightforward. Um, you can also add to it. So if there is a negotiated end to the tenancy such that the tenant, for example, is going to be getting some moving expenses or there is some other agreement that's being part of the agreement to end the tenancy overall, you might want to attach an addendum or another document to that uh, agreement. You can negotiate a mutual agreement to end tenancy at any time. Um, there's no restriction on when you can end your tenancy by agreement. And I love ending tenancies by agreement because you have control over how your tenancy ends. When you go to the branch in a contested end of tenancy matter, there are no guarantees as to what your outcome will be like. And so what better way than to try and resolve the issue yourself? Um, and so I, I highly recommend this option to anybody who is experiencing an unsuccessful tenancy or the tenancy just isn't working uh, for both sides anymore. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Lisa. You bet. This next question is for you, Emma. And the question here is, does a landlord have an automatic right to receive a security deposit? And how do you get your security deposit back? Well, landlords do not have an automatic right uh, to receive a security deposit. Um, normally, the Residential Tenancy Branch Act, I'm sorry, the Residential Tenancy Act sections um, 23, 24, 35, and 36 clearly um, lay out the information that the landlord must offer the tenants two opportunities to do the inspection and the tenant must participate. There are consequences if this is not done. So we strongly recommend you tenants to participate. Uh, but even though the landlord does not have an automatic right, if you, the tenant, cause damages beyond normal wear and tear, uh, then the landlord might ask you to pay and it would be a friendly negotiation. Um, it is important for you to do your inspections on condition inspection report document RTB number 27 that is going to lay out the information at the very end where it says, I, so-and-so person, authorize the landlord to make deductions. So there's that option. And there's the other option where uh, tenants must do an inspection at the beginning, at the end, provide a forwarding address, and then that, that set off the return of the security deposit. The security deposit, um, again, belongs to the tenant. Landlords normally would like to suggest that they will keep it. Uh, but again, you, the tenant, have the power to say, no, I don't give you permission, you need to justify this, or we can go to the dispute resolution process, which is probably better if you are fighting over this. So again, it's important to do, to do your inspections at the beginning, at the end, landlord has an obligation to offer two opportunities. And so the tenants must take one or the other. Uh, normally uh, the inspection is done on the day you take over or another mutually agreed day. And the same would happen for uh, the final inspection. The final inspection can be done prior to you moving out if it was mutually agreed or another mutually agreed day. And so after you're past your inspections, then the next step is providing your forwarding address in writing. And so providing your forwarding address is going to set off that return of the security deposit or is going to set off uh, going to the dispute resolution process if there are damages beyond normal wear and tear and they have been documented in both condition inspections. That's how you get your security deposit when you 
do your inspections, provide your forwarding address, and then the landlord has 15 days to return that money or go to the residential tenancy branch and set a dispute resolution hearing or get your permission in the condition inspection report to get that money or negotiate a specific amount. Super. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Emma. And the next question is for you, Robert, and it follows <laughs> up on that. Uh, Emma mentioned the condition inspection report. What happens if you um, if you if you do not perform one at the beginning of the tenancy? And what happens if a condition inspection is not performed at the end of a tenancy? Okay, so this is um, yeah, so this is a fun conversation to have with landlords because they they're very not if they didn't do their condition inspection at the beginning of the tenancy or the end of the tenancy they could be forfeiting the right to collect the security deposit now the one one major misconception of that is that that the landlord doesn't have any rights to go after damages if if they for whatever reason didn't do a movement inspection let's say you purchased the property and the, the original landlord didn't do a move in inspection. And then, you know, six months into the tenancy, the, the tenants have caused a significant amount of damage to the unit. And um, you're not completely out of luck. That's not, that's not what this is. But you may be out of luck to collect the security deposit. So if for whatever reason you didn't can do a condition inspection, then you may not be able to collect the security deposit. And in most cases, you probably, probably won't. So for that, that may be not an option, but that doesn't prevent you from making a monetary claim. So uh, after the tenancy has ended, you have two years, there's a two year statute of limitations to file for any monetary compensation up to $35,000 per claim uh, for any kind of monetary amount, uh, for any kind of damages, any kind of uh, rent owing, any kind of, any of that stuff. And you are not sort of confined, necessarily confined to what was written in the condition inspection. If you have other proof, like such as videos or, or phones or, you know, um, or, 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 or photos, um, if you have, if you could, you know, if you have police reports, if you have any other evidence to show that, you know, the tenants have caused this issue um, and not the, and, uh, you know, that, you know, you do have that option. But if that is the case, you probably will still have to return the security deposit, which a lot of obviously landlords aren't going to feel very good about because, you know, they're going to say, well, you have, you have you've caused us $35,000 in damage. Why can't I keep the security deposit? Well, it's just the security deposit has its own specific set of rules, just as Emma went over. You have to follow those rules. Everything sort of has to kind of be perfect in those rules in order for you to collect upon that. So if you're missing a movement inspection or a move out inspection, then may, maybe maybe the maybe going after the security deposit isn't the best approach. Is it 100% guaranteed that you will uh, lose a, 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 um, a dispute if you didn't do a condition inspection? I would say probably not. I would say there there could be a possibility, but um, the likelihood of you being successful is definitely much lower than if you have you have done a condition inspection. Super. Thank you so much, Robert, for, for clarifying that. Um, the next question is for you, Lisa, and it also involves security deposits. And the question here is, if you change your mind about a unit after you've signed uh, an agreement with the landlord, will you get your security deposit back? And just one um, thing that you might also touch on is here, we made the assumption that in signing that agreement, you've already made a security a security deposit with the landlord. So is that initial deposit of security something that the landlord is required or entitled to in all cases? No, so that's a great question. So when you sign a tenancy agreement, there'll be a stipulation as to when the security deposit has to be paid. Um, it shouldn't be paid before the tenancy agreement is signed. So the tenancy agreement is your contract uh, with the landlord that sets out when your tenancy starts and when it is supposed to end, if it's a fixed term tenancy or if it's something called a periodic tenancy that goes on a month to month basis. Um, there, the landlord doesn't have to take a security deposit if they don't want to. It's security for damage, so they should take it at the outset. 
Um, and the landlord has the same obligations with any tenant to that security deposit as they do for somebody who continued their tenancy for the full fixed term or someone who wanted to end their tenancy early on or even without even moving into the property. So whether or not a landlord is entitled to keep the security deposit is on the, uh, the basis and the reasons that Emma and Robert already reviewed. So the deposit is meant to, to cover damage beyond reasonable wear and tear to the rental unit. The rights of a landlord to keep a deposit are under the act and are largely connected to the condition inspection report um, and making sure the condition inspection was properly done on move-in. Um, the second uh, piece of this is, can you change your mind uh, and end the contract you signed? Um, yes, uh, and uh, there's different ways to do that. So um, the Residential Tenancy Act in the last couple of years has given some tenants special permission to end a fixed term lease, which is a lease that requires a tenant ordinarily to continue for a fixed period of time with the landlord. Um, and that's the situation of family violence uh, or the requirement to transition to long-term care. So uh, other than that, usually tenants under the act are not allowed without the, the landlord's agreement by way of a mutual agreement to end tenancy, to end their tenancy early, earlier than the end of a fixed term. Periodic tenancies, so tenancies that continue on a month to month basis can be ended by the tenant on one month's notice uh, to the landlord. And again, the security deposit is held um, or handled in the same way as any other tenancy that's ended. Uh, and then we have that mutual agreement to end tenancy as well. So it's always open for a landlord to agree to let a tenant out of their lease uh, earlier than anticipated. And I always encourage landlords to consider that. You don't wanna lock somebody into the tenancy that, that doesn't wanna be there for whatever reason. Uh, it's not good for you, it's not good for the tenant. So really consider those options going forward. But it's important to know and a reminder for tenants that when you sign that tenancy agreement, your rights and obligations start on the day that you've signed. So you, that contract is very, very important. If there's any doubt that you might not continue with the lease, then you shouldn't sign a contract to lease a property. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Can I, can I, can I add to that? So there is, um, that, that everything there is absolutely correct, but I would just like to add that the tenants can still, um, leave if, if for whatever reason in a fixed term. So they can give notice to end a fixed term. The landlords have something called a, um, a duty to minimize loss, which means if they do leave early, the landlord has to do everything they can because it is the business that they run to try to re-rent the property as soon as possible so that there's no, there's no financial loss. So in a climate like like in, the, in the, basically in the kind of current climate, it's, it would be really hard for a landlord to, in let's say, Vancouver, Kelowna, Victoria, to be able to prove for six months that they were unable to re-rent a property because there's basically, you know, um, a, a, you know, a very, very uh, low vacancy rate right now. So it would be very hard for them because they'd have to be able to prove that they weren't able to re-rent the property and they weren't able, you know, and prove that they've, they've abided by their duty to minimize loss. Um, so, so where this sort of plays in is like, if, you know, it would be hard for them to do that here. So the landlord should be able to re-rent the property and you can't re-rent the unit and you can't charge two people rent for the same place at the same time. So the second that the landlord is able either to, uh, either to re-rent the property or until the end of the fixed term contract, whichever one comes first, that would absolve the original tenant from having to pay for the rent going forward. Now, if we lived in some, so that, so it's not a really huge benefit to, to, to landlords in these sort of areas. Now, where, where it comes into play is somewhere like Port Hardy, Smithers, something like that, where if you do, if you, if you do sign a lease and it would be very difficult for the landlord to try to find somebody to replace you, then you could be on the hook for paying the rent, even if you vacate, on the hook for paying the rent until the end of your fixed term tenancy. So that's, that would be sort of... <clears throat> Just a little addition to what Lisa said. So the next question is for you, uh, Emma, which is, am I protected under the residential tenancy laws um, in the case where you share a washroom and a kitchen with a roommate and that roommate is the main renter? Okay, so then um, this goes to section four of the Residential Tenancy Act. And so that states that the act does not apply if there is a living accommodation in which the tenant um, shares 
what bathroom or kitchen facilities with the owner of that accommodation. So in the word here to keep an eye on is owner, but there's also cases where a tenant asks permission to the landlord to get a roommate. And so uh, the roommate pays rent directly to the tenant and they are on a share accommodation as well. They might not be covered under the act. That would be the expertise of an arbitrator. But um, under Section 4, they have a specific list of um, situations that are not covered under Residential Tenancy Act. But if you only rent a room and you share a washroom and kitchen with a roommate, again, who is the main renter? That would be the, the main question I would ask. Who is the main renter? Are you the main renter? Um, is your name on the contract? Because we always base our answers on the contract. Whatever the contract says, then we'll go by that. And so say, for example, that I am the main renter. I ask permission to my landlord to rent rooms. And then the landlord gives me written permission. It would be preferred. And then now the tenant or the roommates, in this case, the roommates or occupants, will pay the rent to me. So I am acting as a landlord. So, but the residential tenancy branch normally does not take jurisdiction on that. And if you are an occupant or a roommate in that situation, you will need the advice of a lawyer. Or you could also um, speak to the people of the civil resolution tribunal or provincial court or Supreme Court if you want to look for legal remedies. Super, thank you so much, Emma. This next question is for you, Lisa, and it is, in what circumstances can a landlord enter a rental unit and how much notice is a tenant entitled to receive before entry? Okay, so being mindful of time, I'm gonna point you to the resource to look at. So that is section 29 <laughs> of the Residential Tenancy Act. It outlines all the circumstances in which a landlord can enter the rental unit and the parameters for doing so. Um, the most common uh, point of entry is on 24 hours written notice to the tenant. Um, and just a reminder for landlords that 24 hours might mean a little bit more depending on how you deliver that notice of entry to the tenant. So if you're emailing your notice, provided that the tenant accepts email for service in the, uh, the tenancy, you're adding three days uh, delivery time on top of that. So be very, very mindful as a landlord that you're not cutting it short in terms of how much notice your tenant is entitled to in the circumstances. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Lisa. And you've no teed problem. us up nicely for the next question, which is for you, Robert. And everyone likes to text. Um, is it okay for landlords and tenants to text each other? And can notices be served via text? So firstly, absolutely, there's nothing preventing landlords and tenants from texting each other. Um, how, however, uh, without any kind of order from the residential tenancy branch, uh, you cannot serve notices, uh, any type of notices via text. Now, does that mean, so what does that mean? Basically, uh, so we get, we get this situation very often where um, the landlord's either selling a property or something and they, they want to give notice to enter, the 24 hours notice in which, in which Lisa was explaining, and they have a good relationship with their tenants. And for the first couple of weeks, it's fine. They text each other and it's all good. But all of a sudden, you know, the, the landlord's done three, um, you know, you know, um, three open houses in one week, and it's starting to feel like a bit much. So now the tenant wants to exercise the, the right to say, no, you have to serve notice properly. Well, proper notice is not served, served by text. Proper notice is served as described by Lisa, basically on a piece of paper, putting that, giving that to the, the tenant, giving them 24 hours notice. If you put it on the door, you got to add three days. So that ends up being four days notice. Um, so that is, so that is something to consider. Now, can you get an order to serve a notice via, via text message? Yes, you can. So if you have a tenant that's sort of our landlord that has sort of disappeared on you and you have no other way to serve them uh, notice uh, because you, 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 you're you going after them for some sort of monetary compensation, you can, as long as you've you know done all your due diligence to try to find this person um, and you are unable to serve them you know via, via the normal methods or by email, you could apply for, for something called substituted service with the residential tenancy branch, and you could get special permission to be able to serve specific documents via, via text message. And you can make that request for any of, any of the documents that would normally have to be served properly. Excellent. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, this next question is for you, Emma. And can a landlord limit the number of occupants in a rental unit? How is the limit administered? And what happens if the tenant exceeds the limit? Well, 
Well, we recommend to tenants to one first, um, the first thing you need to do is read your contract. Your contract is going to tell you what the landlord has stated about the number of tenants allowed. They definitely can specify a maximum number of tenants in a tenancy agreement. So there's also a provision that allows a landlord to evict if there are unreasonable numbers of occupants in a unit. But again, uh, what happens if a tenant exceeds the limit? I just responded that. How is the limit administered? It's the power of the landlord. They need to be specific on the contract and we go back to the contract. If you have questions, call us a track to discuss. Beautiful. Uh, the next question is for you. Um, sorry, Lisa, what happens? Um, if I have a notice dispute with a neighbor in my building, is my landlord required to get involved? That is, protect my right to quiet enjoyment. Yes. <laughs> so uh, you as a landlord have an obligation to ensure that your tenants can use and enjoy the property free from significant disruption or interference. So just because uh, two tenants are scrapping it out in your building doesn't mean that you uh, are absolved from the situation. You might not be causing the noise, but you have an obligation to address it. So absolutely, if there's a noise complaint, if there's any other complaint about tenant disruptions, you as a landlord have an obligation to investigate. And if it looks like there's been a breach of a lease or there's been an incident such that so severe, such that you might want to sever uh, the tenancy relationship with the offending tenant, uh, then that is your duty to proceed and, and go forward with that. So absolutely, you, you are the landlord, you need to get involved. Super, thank you so much, Lisa. Robert, this next question is for you. Um, is my landlord allowed to increase my rent? Are there any laws restricting the amount or frequency of increases? And let's say my landlord wants me to pay an extra $100 a month over the allowable rent increase. Can they uh, kick me out if I refuse? These are very, very, very common questions. So is a landlord allowed to increase my rent? Yes, they are. They're allowed to increase the amount or the rent by... Um, prescribed amount every year, this year being 1.5%. Uh, in order to do so, they have to give a three months notice, uh, which is a form, you have to use the official form on our website, which is a three month notice notifying the tenant of a rent increase. The rent increase would then start three months after the notice has been, three full rental months after the notice has been served. Now, the landlord can only do this once every 12 months. So, and here's a fun fact that a lot of people, this seems to confuse a lot of people, is that let's say you have a five-year tenancy agreement. Your agreement's good for five years. Can the landlord increase my rent using this process uh, each year for each one of those five years? Yes, they can. So just because you're in a five-year tenancy agreement doesn't necessarily mean that you're locked into that amount. The landlord does still have the right to increase the rent by the allotted amount every 12 months. So that is that is a very common misconception. So um, so there's that. And the last question is, my, my landlord wants me to pay an extra $100 a month. This is a very topical question right now, since we have so many um, houses being sold uh, across the province with tenants and with very high purchase prices. So you have these uh, situations, you have these new landlords who have just acquired tenants who probably pay uh, below average, um, below market average rent. And that concerns them because they, they probably are paying quite a bit for their mortgage because the cost of houses has gone up um, so dramatically in recent years. Can they ask that? So you, if they can ask, there's no issue with asking. Are you required to pay it? No, you are not required to pay it. Um, can they kick you out if, I, if they refuse? Well, that is a big question. They're not supposed to. But um, they, you know, uh, the major common thread is that the landlord will take over the property and live there for at least six months. So that is, that is something that does come up quite a bit. Um, but I mean, if you are able to, if, if, you've, if that has happened to you and that conversation has happened to you, I would encourage you to dispute the notice and essentially bring up those, um, those facts to the, the, the arbitrator because that could be deemed as serving that notice in bad faith because the, the, the true intention is not to move into the unit. The true intention is to have the tenant vacate so they can down the road um, essentially increase the rent by an, um, a higher amount. 
One final note on this, can we both agree to increase the rent? That is a very common question right now. Can both parties agree to, to, to increase the rent? Yes. One of the, I can't remember which policy guideline it is, but in one of the policy guidelines, it does describe um, uh, a process to do so. So that would be, um, you would have to have an agreement signed by the landlord and the tenant, and you would serve the three month notice uh, of rent increase. So you would serve those two documents together, the landlord and the tenant agree to pay a new price, uh, and then the, the rent increase, it would take place three months after, just like a normal rent increase. Now, if, if the, the landlord, I'm gonna to try to explain this as quickly as possible, but if the landlord has, um, uh, the tenant could potentially argue later on that the, ten, that the landlord forced them to do this under duress. Now, this may not be a very easy thing to prove, but it's something that could come up. So if, especially in a, in a rental market like this, where, you know, the landlord's threatening to move into the property, if they don't pay this additional rent increase, um, you know, the tenant could make an argument saying, well, they, you know, I was going to end up on, this, you know, end up homeless as a result uh, if I didn't sign it. So I had to sign it. So the tenant could make an, ar ar an argument to an arbitrator that the landlord had uh, forced the tenant to sign this under duress. Kind of a difficult thing to prove, but it's a possibility. Um, and then if that is the case, the tenant, the landlord could be forced to repay the tenant all the, uh, the amount of the, of the rent increase. So that is a possibility. I'm going to turn to the next question. And Emma, this one is for you. And the question here is, when is it okay for a landlord to evict a tenant and will you be compensated? I'll try to give you the short answer. Landlords mm -hmm. must have specific reasons for evictions, okay? Um, there are four types of evictions in BC uh, under residential tenancies. And so there will be um, one, month notice, one month notice for cause, then they notice for non-payment of rent and utilities, two month notice for landlord's use of property, and the four month notice for demolitions, repairs, and conversions. So, for all of these, landlords must have specific reasons. There are new um, information that has come for the four month notice from the residential tenancy branch, but I'm just gonna go very quickly through the eviction process. Um, landlords need to have a reason, okay? Then they notice for non-payment of rent and in utilities is very self very clear. And so one month notice for cause, different reasons. The landlord may be noisy. Uh, the tenant is causing damages to the unit. They are jeopardizing the safety of other tenants. The two month notice for landlord's use of property is when the landlord wants to take over the unit or the tenant does not qualify for a subsidized unit anymore, or the landlord is selling the property and the purchaser wants to move in. And so um, for the two month notice, tenants get compensated one month, and that is normally the second month. The same would go for the four month notice. It's a four month notice for renters, repairs, and conversion. So landlords should have permits in place as the residential tenancy branch uh, provided information on July 1st of last year. And so um, all landlords must get permits then be approved to provide the four month notice to the tenant. And so if you get a four month notice, then you will get compensated on the fourth month. So those are the only compensations you get. There's no negotiation for the 10 day notice nor for the one month notice. It will always be two month notice and four month notice where tenants get compensated. That's a short Super. version. Super, thank you so much, Emma, much appreciated. And there are more resources on People's Law School website as well. And we'll have links to those along with the recording of the webinar. Um, Emma, another question for you, which is, is my landlord allowed to kick me out of the unit if I ask for repairs? Hypothetically speaking, no, right? Um, all landlords must comply with Section 32 of the Residential Tenancy Act, and they also need to comply with standards of maintenance from the city where the property is sitting at. Um, they also need to comply with some other documents. There is a document that I love from the Residential Tenancy Branch, and it is policy guideline number one that talks about the rights and responsibilities for both um, on a tenancy. So is your landlord allowed to kick you out if you are for repairs? Not really. Uh, you definitely have an obligation to report. You definitely must do it in writing. Make sure you keep copies whenever you send something to your landlord. If the landlord doesn't follow up and you keep on asking, then probably you might like to consider um, dispute resolution on that one and then ask for an order of compliance. But the short answer is no, your landlord cannot kick you out because you ask for repairs. It is your right to ask for repairs. 
And that's Beautiful. the short answer. Thank you so much, Emma. And I'd just like to highlight that your website has some template letters, including a letter that helps tenants write that letter to their landlords requesting repairs. Um, the next question that we have is for you, Robert. And the question is, um, what is a direct request proceeding uh, with the residential tenancy branch? And how is it different from an ordinary proceeding with a residential tenancy branch? Perfect. Okay. Um, so uh, a direct request process is only for one type of eviction. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way for an, um, a landlord to be able to, uh, um, to be granted an order of possession and a monetary order. Um, uh, well, in some cases, substantially quicker than through the normal uh, participatory hearing process. So the direct request is only used for evictions that involve non-payment of rent. So if the landlord has served a, a tenant a 10 day notice for unpaid rent, um, the tenant didn't. So the conditions for it are, there are conditions in where you can apply, you can apply and can, when you can apply. So some of the conditions are one, the tenant has not, has not paid the rent within the five days as prescribed in the notice. And two, the tenant has not, um, that has, um, has not applied for dispute resolution at that time. So if, if those two criteria are met, and as long as the landlord has all the necessary documentation. So with it, what is required is a copy of a signed copy of a tenancy agreement, a copy of the 10 day notice, an RTB 34 proof of service, which is a document basically um, confirming that this 10 day notice was served uh, typically by an adult witness um, or proof that it was sent via registered mail and a monetary order worksheet, which is a breakdown of the amount of rent that's owed. So as long as they have all those documents and those two criteria are satisfied, the tenant, the, the landlord can apply for something called a direct request process, which is, uh, and um, it's, it's, a, it's an ex parte hearing. So instead of having a participatory hearing with the arbitrator, the landlord and the tenant, you end up having uh, an adjudicator review the documents submitted by the landlord and are, um, and a decision is made. So the difference between this is essentially the tenant doesn't really necessarily get an opportunity to be heard um, because it, the issue itself is, is quite black and white. So we have that, that direct request process for, um, for, for that one particular purpose. And all the paperwork has to be perfect. If the paperwork's not per perfect, um, if there's any issues, if there's any conflicting information, names are kind of wrong, um, then the, the, the adjudicator cannot proceed with granting an order of possession. A participatory hearing would have to happen. So the only way an ex parte hearing can happen is that. We do offer direct requests uh, for the return of security deposits to tenants, similar criteria. Um, the landlord did not apply to keep the security deposit and you have a copy of the tenancy agreement. You have proof that you've served the landlord with a, um, with a, uh, a copy of your forwarding address and 15 days has passed since then, uh, the tenant can also apply for direct request for the return of double of their security deposit via that method as well. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Robert. And that tees us up nicely for Lisa. So Lisa, the question here is, what happens at a residential tenancy branch hearing and what happens? What can you do if you disagree with the resulting decision? Okay, a residential tenancy branch hearing by default is held over the telephone. It's about 60 or 90 minutes in length. It's your opportunity to present your case verbally to an arbitrator. In advance of that, uh, you'll have the ability to file evidence and written submissions that you want the arbitrator to consider in conducting the, uh, in conducting the, the dispute resolution process. Um, the arbitrator has rules of procedure that they look to to see about who goes first in terms of presenting their evidence. Um, it's largely flexible and dependent on your arbitrator, but the important thing is that everybody gets an opportunity to present their side of the story, so to speak, which might involve calling witnesses as well. Um, so it's, it's a rather speedy hearing. It's not a, a long uh, ordeal, and it's uh, something that you should prepare for well in advance of getting your hearing date so that you, you uh, have your case ready to go. 
Now, sometimes you don't agree with the decision that uh, you receive after your hearing, and there are some options for you. So uh, in the interest of time, you can visit section 79 through 82 of the Residential Tenancy Act, and that outlines the ability to review a decision maker's decision on the basis of various issues. Um, your first opportunity is to apply for a review internally with the branch. Your second opportunity is to apply to court, the Supreme Court, to review and essentially supervise a decision of the residential tenancy branch. There are very, very high hurdles and quick timelines with when it comes to any sort of review. So in these situations, I highly encourage you, if you are considering challenging a branch decision, seek legal advice first so that you know whether or not you have a shot uh, to have another and have another kick at the can, so to speak. Beautiful. Yes. Thanks so much, Lisa. And I'm going to actually throw the first live question to you, which is, um, and it has the most upvotes, 10. So I'm a single, I'll read you the, the full question. I'm a 60 year old single renter living on savings, unemployed with no pension. How do you deal with people like me with discriminatory questions like proof of income and employment during interviews with prospective landlords without losing bids to young employed renters? That's the first part. Second part, for privacy reasons, can I refuse to give out my social insurance number for credit checks from landlords? Thank you. Great question. So I'm going to start with the first one. So in BC, apart from the Residential Tenancy Act, we have legislation called the Human Rights Code that protects um, individuals uh, for their ability to rent a property free from discrimination and to continue living in a property free from <coughs> discrimination. One of the protected grounds is lawful source of income. So you shouldn't be evicted or you shouldn't have your rental application dismissed on the basis that you live on retirement savings. As long as you can establish that you have sufficient uh, funds to pay your rent, uh, regardless of the source of that income, so long as it's lawful, uh, you shouldn't be denied the right to rent. So where can you go? Um, the Human Rights Tribunal uh, is the entity that decides human rights complaints in the province, and they have a wide range of resources available to individuals who feel like they have been discriminated against uh, in their tenancy or the tenancy application process. So you can go there. On the second piece with the social insurance number, we go to the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner, OIPC for short. And so the guidelines that Robert referenced earlier do address this issue about the social insurance number. That's one of the most personal of personal information belonging to you. And the Privacy Commissioner's <laughs> position on that is that you should not be required to submit it. It should be at your option. There's other ways and less invasive personal information that can be collected for a credit check. So it's uh, within your right to say no. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Lisa. And um, the next question, then Robert, sure. um, you have a ten two tenants, boyfriend and girlfriend. They sign a one-year lease that ends at May 1st, 2022. Um, the lease turns month to month after that date. The girlfriend is leaving and may not come back. Can the other tenant rent to a friend her share while she is away? Do I need consent? Um, do I need do I need to consent to the roommate? Uh, it depends on what it says in your tenancy agreement. So um, if let's say this, so here's a, there's a few parts to that question. So one one is if if the if the um, the one partner that's leaving gives give is actually leaving forever. If they give notice, if one person gives notice, it ends the tenancy for all parties. So the landlord has the option there to just completely end the tenancy. Um, if, if, if it's at the, if it's at the periodic stage, which means after the fixed term is over, if the fixed term is still going, then the remaining tenant, can, it was still ends the tenancy, but the remaining tenant can stay there until the end of the fixed term, provided that they provide their pay, they pay the full amount of rent. Now, it, when you're talking about if they're renting the full unit it, it, and you're on a periodic month to month tenancy, so that wouldn't be considered a sublet. So in this situation, you'd have to look to see what you had written in your tenancy agreement about uh, specifically about occupants. If you have a term in your tenancy agreement that says um, no additional occupants, only the people listed in the tenancy agreement can reside there, something like that, something to that effect, then that is enforceable. You wouldn't, um, they, you, that would be a basically a material term of the contract that they could not break. So they couldn't bring somebody in. But if you don't have that written into the addendum and that just to be clear, that's not written into the standard RTB one that's on the, on the website, the, um, the tenancy agreements on the website. So that would have to be an additional term that's on, that's in the 
um, that, that you've added as an addendum. If you've if you haven't done that, then they would be allowed to bring somebody in, provided that the that the tenant that left did not give their written notice to vacate. Super. Thank you so much, Robert, and so much appreciate your answer. And I think if you're okay with it, one more question. Is everyone <laughs> okay? Lisa, I'm going to send this one to you. Okay. Um, if your landlord does not provide written notice, i.e. notice attached to your door at the end of a year, can he send a letter listing his grievances from the past year oh. as a reason to evict you due to not taking care in his un undocumented opinion of the premises? Oh dear. So uh, here's the thing. This, when a landlord or a tenant has an issue in their tenancy, there is an obligation to bring it to the forefront uh, promptly. And you can't sit on your problems, nor do you want to sit on your problems. You don't want to sit on a problem that manifests in to such a degree that you would end a tenancy. So um, there's a bit of a question mark there in terms of how bad the problems were if the landlord didn't uh, take steps to enforce the agreement uh, until after the year is out. Why wait the year? You can, you can act on it uh, sooner. Same on the tenancy side of things. So uh, I would suspect that if this went before the residential tenancy branch, the arbitrator might have some questions for the landlord as to why they didn't pursue the issues earlier. Um, if they were that bad, they should have enforced the lease uh, well, well b before now. Why wait? That's <laughs> my advice. Super. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. And we are past time. So we're going to um, wrap up today's webinar. A big, big thank you to all of you. A big thank you to you, Lisa, Emma, Robert, your information that you've shared today has been so valuable. A big thank you to all of you who are here today.